In our ongoing series commemorating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, we're getting close. Today we come to the teaching on Scripture, so I thought I'd bring my big black Bible. Hear now this word from 2 Timothy. Now you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions, and my suffering, the things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But wicked people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from who you learned it and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. So when Martin Luther posted his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg on October the 31st, 1517, he was objecting to bad preaching and bad theology on the doctrine of grace. The idea of the indulgences, that you could pay a little money and get yourselves or a loved one out of some time in purgatory. Luther believed that God's grace was freely given to us, that there was nothing we could do to earn God's grace, and in particular, that we couldn't buy it. And this idea of the indulgences was dangerous and was harming the people. That was his original point. He wanted an academic disputation about this particular issue. His concern was that the church get back to good preaching and good theology. And yet, his critics immediately took the debate in a different direction. They perceived that Luther was challenging the authority of the church, and in particular, the authority of the Pope. And that, though that didn't seem to be Luther's initial concern, he did over this ensuing years get kind of backed into that corner. So, so that by 1520, when he published his essay, The Babylonian Captivity of the Church, he was in fact calling into question the church's authority, and particularly that of the Pope. Then the next year, in 1521, at the Diet of Worms, spelt like Worms, but in German Worms, Luther was called before the powers of the state and of the church. They told him that his doctrines were heretical and told him he needed to recant. And the famous line, he didn't actually say, the here I stand, I can do no other, but it's a stirring and great summary of what he did say. The essence of his objection was, I have based my teachings upon my reading of scripture, and so far you have done nothing to prove me wrong. You have not employed arguments from scripture to show how I have misread. I'm open to being disproved, if you can do it, but until you do, I will continue to believe and to preach what I have found in God's holy word. And so from this crucial moment is where arises one of the core teachings of the Protestant Reformation, sola scriptura, the idea that the scripture is our sole authority in a life of faith and practice. Now Luther was among this new wave of scholars in Europe who were interested in going back and reading the original and early text. They were reading the New Testament in Greek instead of Latin, beginning to read the Old Testament in Hebrew, 
and beginning to understand the original ideas and looking back at other classical texts and early thinkers. And, and in doing so, beginning to understand that some of the accretion of tradition and doctrine over the years had gotten away from what they saw as the original ideas of Christianity. And so we needed to go back to those early texts and begin to read them and understand them. And so here in the 16th century begins a new form of biblical scholarship that is recognizable to us as a modern form of scholarship. We can, even today, read those early reformers and their commentaries on the Bible and, and recognize them as a, as a similar form to the kind of scholarship that is done today. They, they start a new way of studying and reading and talking about the Scripture. And so for Luther, that was essential, to go back and study and understand what the Bible in its original languages and in the original centuries would have meant, how people would have understand it, what the authors intended. But Luther not only believed that, he also believed radically new things about the Bible. One that Katie hinted at in her children's sermon is that the Bible should be available to everyone. Luther translated the scripture into a very colloquial German. Scholars say that this helped to form the modern German language, one of the key texts in all of German literature is Luther's translation of the Bible in the same way that the King James Version of the Bible would be an essential text in the history of English literature and helping to form and shape our language. Luther wanted to make the Bible available to ordinary people in their language in ways that they could understand so that they could begin to study. And this flowed from his idea that Christians are free that they are themselves priests, that they need no intermediary to stand between them and God, to speak to God on their behalf or for God, on God's behalf to them, that they ought to be able to open the Bible, to read it for themselves, to form their own beliefs and opinions about their religious faith in order to engage in their own intimate relationship with God. And so the role of the minister changed. From being the medieval priest, the minister became someone who arose from the congregation, who was then sent off to school to get more training and more education so that they could then come back and equip the people in their own spiritual lives and their own reading of the text to understand it better and use those skills in their own lives. So the whole idea was to develop the congregation as a group of readers. And thus, literacy burst upon the Protestant countries in the ensuing centuries. It became essential that people then be taught how to read. Early Sunday schools were an effort in order to teach people how to read. Public schools even had a kind of religious function, teaching people to read so that they could read the Bible for the purpose of their own religious faith and their own spirituality. And so reading is one of the practices that arises from Luther's radical ideas. I think how much this congregation loves to read. You just go to our book sale twice every year and see at the gym full of your cast-off books. And I know those are the cast-off books. I've been in plenty of your homes and there are thousands of non-cast-off books in most of our homes. I remember John and Dorothy Hill, our, our beloved uh, Dorothy, who's now deceased, and John, who's living in Arizona. When you went into their home, it was hard to walk through to find a space that wasn't covered by a pile of books. I was always concerned that the books were going to fall over and bury them, and, you know, we wouldn't find them for a few days. So we became a people who love books and who love reading so that we can shape our own ideas and our own opinions. And in fact... As the Reformation went on, it's not only that it became a right to read, it became something of an obligation. You needed to learn to read. You needed to read the Bible in order to have an intimate relationship with God, in order to develop your own faith. And so what was once forbidden at all, first a right, and then an obligation and a duty. Luther also believed that Scripture was not some 
fancy, difficult, complex thing that needed lots of training in order to understand that, and that there shouldn't be these layers of allegorical and mysterious reading. He believed that the text was plain and simple and that there were literal readings, that the ordinary, average, uneducated person should be able to understand the plain and simple message of Scripture available to everyone. These were the world-changing ideas from 500 years ago. Now what about for us in the 21st century? Is Scripture our sole authority for faith and practice? Martin Luther believed that before you read the Bible, you ought to prepare for it. You ought to pray and get in the right mindset and the right attitude. And that you read in order to form your faith and to deepen your faith. But not long after Luther had made these changes, modern philosophy began to say, well, you know, you ought to probably come with it with an open mind and ask some critical questions and maybe entertain some doubt. And then in the ensuing centuries, all sorts of developments arise. The Enlightenment and its focus upon reason. Pietism and Romanticism and its focus upon taking your own personal experience into your spiritual life and your reading of the text. Scientific developments and experimentation, the the encounters of Europeans and Americans with the scriptural text from other faith traditions around the world. And good readers, good people of the book began reading other ideas and different ideas and challenging ideas. And and then the rise of geology and archeology span and new paradigms in biology begin to question things that we had believed and understood about Scripture. And all the while, good readers, good people of the book, began to read these ideas and, and bring more questions and more doubts to the reading of the scriptural text. And so, what had been the sole authority then began to be talked about as the first authority. So John Wesley, the great founder of Methodism, has his famous quadrilateral, that there are four authorities, scripture, tradition, reason, and experience, that you begin with scripture, but you need some tradition in order to understand what it is you're reading. But then you also have to engage your own individual reason and personal experience to understand what's going on in order to develop your own beliefs and interpret the scripture. Fred Nelson and I are teaching a class on the first forum on the Reformation one day, and next week we will be talking about this doctrine. So if you have follow-up questions, come next week to forum. As we were preparing, Fred said, I wonder if for most liberal mainline Protestants in the 21st century, is Scripture even an authority at all? Or have so many other authorities been entered into the equation that Scripture is not so widely read. And we know that's true. We know that biblical literacy it is its lowest point in the last 500 years. People don't, aren't as acquainted with the Bible. They aren't reading it in the way that we once did. I find that all the time in preaching. I'll preach on some text and someone will come and say, I never heard that story before. So clear evidence that we are not reading Scripture, not only as an obligation, but as this right that we once fought and died for. So in some ways, maybe the Roman Catholics of Luther's time who worried that all chaos would ensue from Luther were right that once you opened that can of worms, <laughs> I, the choir challenged me to use that, so that it would get away from you. Is it possible that we've reached that point? Interestingly, before the, this 500th anniversary began, the Lutheran World Federation, the Roman Catholic Church, put out a document together emphasizing all the ways in the last 50 years that they've come closer together and help trying to resolve some of the 500 euro doctrinal disputes. It's an interesting uh, pamphlet to read. And on this very point, on the Sola Scriptura, they seem to have, have found some agreement. In the last 50 years, uh, Roman Catholics and Vatican II are much more open to individual reading of Scripture and, and understanding the, uh, the role of the individual. 
Lutherans have also over time begun to realize the, emphasis, the importance of tradition and reading in community and that, and that you need both. That, doc, that document says that therefore regarding scripture and tradition, Lutherans and Catholics are in such extensive agreement that their different emphases do not of themselves require maintaining the present division of the churches. In this area, there is unity and reconciled diversity. So what once may have schismed the church, now we have agreement. But what role for scripture? Bruce Epperly, a United Church of Christ theologian, has this great little essay on what the teachings of the Reformation mean for us in the 21st century. And on this one, he writes, to be faithful to scripture, today's Christians must see it as a living and evolving document, variable in revelation from page to page. We can no longer live comfortably with passages that promote violence and the objectification of women, non-believers in the GLBT community. We must, with Luther and other reformers, look for the word of grace within the words of scripture. A graceful reading of scripture opens us to experiencing divine wisdom in science, medicine, literature, and non-Christian faiths, scripture is always an open door and never a closed closet. Our former moderator, Ken Friedman Fitch, when we were getting the new Pew Bible, said, it is our reading of scripture that made us liberals. Using the scripture as this open door into all the other things that we should read and understand and think about and questions to ask as God's faithful people. For me, the Bible is still that place where I am challenged and convicted and inspired and comforted, that those stories help me to understand my story as part of a larger story, that they help me to understand myself and who I am and who I could be. I am shaped by the reading of this text. And so here on this 500th anniversary of a transformation in what it means to be God's people and how we relate to God and that we do it by engaging and reading this text, I invite you to read the Bible again as wonderful, beautiful words of God's life with us that can speak to us and guide us and inspire and comfort us. For it is your right, and it is your duty, as a free-thinking, beloved child of God.